So this is part two of chapter 48, and we left off talking about some fun facts about neurons, about how long they can be, but I want to jump back into our content here, and starting with vocabulary. So first of all, we have what's called a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell, and it's just what it sounds like. So a presynaptic cell is the cell that's actually transmitting the signal to its synapse, and then receiving that signal is going to be one of three things. Um, it's going to be one of these postsynaptic cells, either another neuron, or it could be a motor um, type of cell, like a muscle cell, muscular um, cell. And then we also have glandular cells. This is a picture showing us the thyroid gland. So the postsynaptic cell, oops, we just skipped through quite a few slides somehow. Wow, totally lost my place. Hold on just a second. Okay, the wonders of PowerPoint. Back on track here. So these postsynaptic cells are also called effector cells because they're going to receive the effect um, of the message to respond to the original stimulus. Okay, so another type of cell that you're going to find in the nervous system are glia cells, and they're actually a group of different cells. But what they have in common is that they are support cells for the neurons. They have jobs like bringing nutrients to the neurons, they repair them, they provide the structural support system around them, and they also work at clearing away debris. So things like dead or dying neurons, they will clear that up. So one thing that glia cells do not have is uh, they do not have um, any sort of resting potential or an action potential that would be generated because of that resting potential. And again, we're going to look very closely at what those things are, but they're responsible for transmitting the nerve impulse. So if you don't have those, you know that the glia cells have nothing to do with the transmission of a nerve signal. But what they do is, first of all, they're very plentiful because we have 10 to 50 times more glial cells in our brain than we have neurons. Um, they also um, do not have chemical synapses. So again, they're not involved in communicating signals and passing them on. <coughs> These are five different types of glia cells, just to give you an idea of some of the things that they do. So the astrocytes are involved with the physical and nutrient support, as you can see here, in cleaning up debris. And the microglia also um, are involved in cleanup by digesting parts of dead neurons. Two types of cells provide myelin for the neurons. So typically when you learn about the myelin sheath of a neuron, you learn about Schwann cells. But really, Schwann cells are only found outside the central nervous system. So they're only in the peripheral nerves. So the sensory nerves, the motor nerve, uh, neurons all have Schwann cells providing the myelin coating for the axons. But if you look at a cell with or a neuron within the central nervous system, it actually has a different type of myelin coating, and it's called the oligodendroglia. And so that is just a different type of glia cell that's providing support and structure. And then finally, we have satellite cells which are the ones that are kind of like the skeleton around neurons to hold them in place. So you'll, you would find those in also the peripheral nervous system. So now on to section 48.2. Um, this is talking about how the nerve impulse actually occurs. And it begins by uh, focusing on where that how that nerve impulse, where it's going to actually be taking place. And it has to do with the membrane of our neuron. So within the membrane, we have ion pumps and ion channels who maintain the resting potential of the neuron. And they also are, are involved in ch 
changing that resting potential to an action potential, and then they're also responsible and involved in getting everything reset back to their resting potential after an impulse. <coughs> so first of all, let's start with um, the fact that every cell has a voltage, which means that it has a difference in electrical charge across its plasma membrane. That difference in voltage, again, is called the membrane potential. When that membrane potential is in a neuron that's not doing anything, it's just sitting there, then it's called the resting potential. And the resting potential of a neuron is generally, well, it's, it is a negative number. It's a negative 70 millivolts. And what that's telling you is that because it's negative, that means the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell. So that difference in negativity gives you a negative potential of our neuron. And the resting potential, again, they cal it's a range, but we can just um, focus in on the number 70. But the range actually goes up to 80. Um, and some um, references will actually even say it's down to 60. So somewhere in there, we're, we're, we'll land at 70 millivolts. It, negative 70 millivolts, actually, is the resting potential of a neuron. So the transmission of that signal, um, when we talk about that, I like to use the analogy of dominoes because that it, it so closely and clearly describes how a nerve impulse travels in a lot of different ways. One of them is how a nerve impulse starts. So when you have a set of dominoes, you have to tip over that first one. It's not just that you can't partially tip it over, you have to fully tip it over. So until it actually topples, and you cannot start your dominoes falling in their line. So you have to get that threshold pass, knock down that first domino to trigger the actual signal transmission. And so then the second part that's similar is the actual continuation of the, s or propagation of the signal. So dominoes don't all fall down at one time. They actually fall down in a wave motion one at a time. So it's just moving down and it actually, if you ever watch dominoes falling, that there's so many videos showing that, it looks like a wave uh, just flowing along from one domino to another. And it's very similar, again, to how a nerve travels down one neuron and then passes on to the next and travels down that neuron. And then the other similarity is that once the signal has already passed through, once all the dominoes are down, you cannot have another series of dominoes falling until you pick them all up and put them back the way they were at the beginning. So you have to stand all the dominoes back up in order for that wave to travel again. And it's exactly the same with a nerve. You have to return back to the resting potential. You have to get everything back to the way it was before the nerve impulse passed by in order for there to be another impulse. So no, there cannot be a second impulse until everything is set back to the original. So what we call that starting portion where the first domino has to fall, we call that an all or nothing response. And we actually say that there is a threshold potential that has to be reached. So a threshold is, is that place you have to get to in order to start. And once you do, it keeps going into completion. Okay, so in the mammalian neuron at resting potential, you're going to find different concentrations of, dif of these different ions. And essentially what you need to know is that at resting potential, so at a resting state in a neuron, 
the inside of the cell has a higher concentration of potassium and the outside of the cell has a higher concentration of sodium. Bec and those are the two ions that are going to cause um, the transmission of this nerve impulse and also the resetting of the resting potential. So we'll look at how that happens more carefully. You also see some other different ions in this diagram, and we'll look at those on the next slide. Oh, actually, we have one more, and then we'll look at this. Darn it. Um, so actually, they are listed here. So we also have chlorine located, and actually there's chlorine on both sides. And you know that chlorine's a negative charged ion, um, but in the actuality, there's chlorine on both sides of this membrane. So it's not the chlorine that's causing this negative charge inside. What is more responsible are these AA minuses, which are really are standing for amino acids. Um, there are negatively charged proteins within the neurons that actually are responsible for a lot of that negative charge inside the cell. But more importantly, where we get our negative and positive charge difference is essentially the fact that there is a greater positive outside than there is inside. Because as you may have noticed, sodium and potassium both have positive charges. And we've been talking about while there's high potassium inside and high sodium outside, but they're both positive, so how is that getting a negative charge inside the cell? And it really has to do a lot with these um, negative proteins that are inside. So let's take a look at this next diagram. This next diagram shows you that these negatively charged proteins are really large um, relative to our ions in particular. And they do not pass, first of all, they're too large to pass through the membrane, Second of all, they have a negative charge, so they're not going to pass through our membrane here. And so they maintain this negative charge inside the cell. Um, you'll see here, this diagram is actually showing these green chloride um, ions as being outside the cell. So they're not really involved in making this gradient, this difference. And then you're going to see here, these positive oranges are our potassium, and the positive blues out here are our sodium. But what I, one of the things I really like about this diagram is it's showing the membrane as you guys learned about it. Oh, there goes my picture again. Um, and it's showing some of these protein channels. So in this case, we have a sodium protein channel, which is specific to just let sodium pass through. And we also have potassium protein channels, which again, specific, they're only going to allow potassium through. And some of these channels are open all the time, but not very many. It's a very small number of these are going to be open when there is um, a cell at resting potential. So when there's no stimulus, no impulse that's traveling down the neuron, most of these are going to be closed. Um, and the few that are open, what we call that is leakage <laughs> of our ions. So whenever, again, we have a high concentration of something like potassium inside, it's going to want to move with facilitated diffusion through this channel. And so it's going to do that, um, whether it's at resting potential or not. But again, remember, there are just a very small number of these open. So there's not very much movement occurring. Um, also, the same goes for our potassium out here. It's going to want to move down this concentration gradient into the cell. And there are even fewer of these sodium channels that are open at resting state. So very little movement of sodium is occurring. But the little that does occur is taken care of by this sodium-potassium pump. And so this is an active transport pump, so it's using ATP every time it has to work. And what's really clever about this pump is that every time it works, 
it takes three 